Hi, my name is Crystal Olavaria, and I'm the Career Conversationalist. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, today, I have a couple of awesome promises. I'm going to go ahead and share a print screen so you know what you can be looking forward to today. Um, this is an event page on Google that I will be posting every week so that you can go ahead and see uh, the upcoming topics. So I'd appreciate it if you would hit the share event and like it or plus it. But today we're going to be talking about what can you do with a marine biology de degree. Discover three occupation with bright job growth outlooks. Avoid the most common misunderstandings about employment and learn three ways to respond to you will not make a lot of money. So pretty much this came about just talking and interviewing with students. So I really appreciate the feedback um, from those of you who I've been talking to and interviewing. And thank you so much. So that's how the show got started. And uh, that's this is the first episode where I will be answering your questions. So please continue to engage and let me know what your concerns are so that this way I can help provide some answers. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and do a quick review of what is a marine biologist. Well, marine stands to relating of the sea. And a biologist is the science of studying living matter. So you combine those together and it's the science of of studying living matter in the sea. Now, one of the things that's really confusing about marine biology is it's a big umbrella. So when you start searching for jobs, there are a lot of different jobs that you can have as a marine biologist, but they're not necessarily going to be listed under a marine as a marine biologist. So what I mean by that is this is the little graphic I created, and it talks about aquaculture, marine biotechnology, environmental biology, and toxicology. These are all areas where there are jobs, but if you look under a marine biologist, you might not find these jobs, even though they include just that. So that's part of the confusion is it's a very big, um, there's a lot of, it, it goes back to the language and understanding what are you looking for, especially if you're looking for jobs and if they're going to be a good fit for you. So I'm going to tell you how to do that and where to look and what to type in. So with that, I'm going to give you some statistics that come from none other than our U.S. Department of Labor. Now, these statistics are not actually from their website. What it is, is their website, I don't know if you've ever been to it, but it's kind of hard to read. It's a lot of data. It's like looking at the raw data. And so there's a website that I'm going to show you that takes all of their information, and it makes it really easy to understand, and they organize it by um, job type and what they do. So um, with that, let's get started. And I just want you to know that they, the five different jobs that I'm going to share with you do require several different degrees. And I think it's interesting that on this website, one job, if you look, it breaks it down statistically, so it's nice, because you see you don't only need a bachelor's degree to do a job. Sometimes a job is broken out into a percentage where a certain percent of people who do that particular job have a bachelor's degree, while maybe the other percent might have a master's degree or might only have a high school diploma or some other certificate. So that's really interesting because in the job market, we tend to think, oh, you need a particular type of degree to do something. And this website breaks it out statistically as far as people who currently hold a job and what kind of education they have. And it's interesting to note that um, typically when it comes to correlation, we tend to, edu to assume more education equals higher pay. But I really want to focus our conversations on supply and demand as far as this is where a lot of the jobs are being created. Technology is changing things. Um, it's changing where the jobs are. It's changing um, what employ employers need as far as a skilled workforce. So with that, um, the first job I'm going to tell, tell you about is a biological science teachers and post-secondary. Now, if you notice this number right here, I'm going to tell you what to do with that number. There's a website, and so if you don't want to type all of this in, sometimes it's often easier and quicker just to find the actual job by typing in these numbers. But the median wage for 2004 was $74,580 annually. The projected job growth uh, for from 2012 to 2022 is faster than average. 
it's 15 to 21 percent and project projected job growth for the same time period 2012 to 2022 is estimated that 21,200 jobs will be created now if you really want to get a lot of information out of this video and you're watching it um, especially say on your phone or on a laptop a great way to take notes if you're like oh that interests me is to go ahead and take a a screen share while I'm sharing these cards. That's one of the reasons why I decided to do this. So I will go ahead and hold it up again for you right now. So if you like, go ahead and take a screen share if this is something you're interested in. And then that's a quick and easy way to take digital notes and to refresh in your mind if this is something you really want to do. The next job opportunity is environmental scientists. Um, their medium wage for 2014 was $31.58 hourly and $66,250 annually. Projected growth from 2012 to 2022 is faster than average. It's 15% to 21%. And the projected job growth for the same time period, 2012 to 2022, is 39,700 jobs will be created. Okay, the next one is environmental restoration planners. The medium wage for 2014 was $31.85 hourly and $66,250 annually. Projected growth for 2012 to 2022 is faster than average with 15% to 21% and projected job growth for the same time period, 2012 to 2022, is also 39,700 jobs. Okay, the next one is going to be commercial divers. The median wage in 2014 is $22.06 hourly and $45,890 annually. Projected growth for 2012 to 2022 is a lot faster than average. It should be much faster than average, which is 22 plus percent. Project, projected job growth for the same time period, 2012 to 2022, is 1,900 jobs. Okay, and the next one is sellers and marine oilers. The medium wage is from 2014, $18.80 per hour, and that comes out to $39,100 annually, with a projected growth of 2000, from 2012 to 2022, faster than average, growth with 15 to 21%, and projected job growth for the same time period, 2012 to 2022, is 19,300 jobs. All right, so did any of those capture your interest? Are you interested in knowing more information about them? I'm hoping that you said yes, and I'm gonna show you where to go right now. So go ahead and take a screen capture of this. It's called ONET, and you can find it by typing onetonline.com. So, or sorry, one on, onetonline.com. Um, it breaks basically looks like one ton online if you look at all the little words inside of it. Um, pretty much this is a government website with a lot of information on it. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just so you can get a feel for what the website is and how to look up some additional information. So this is the site and as you see in this top right corner there is something that says occupation quick search. Okay, and so the numbers that I was telling you about on the top of the card, we're going to go ahead and fill that information in. So, for example, if I type in, uh, let's go with an environmental restorational planners. And so up in this upper right hand corner, I'm going to type in 19. Um, what is that a dash? 2041 period 02 and hit enter. 
that's going to come up with it right here. You see how it comes up with the number right over here. And then over here it says Environmental Restoration Planners. You see it has a little bright sun that says Bright Outlook and then a green leaf that says it's a green field. So if we click on it, it's going to pull up all this information about it. Um, one of the things that I really like about this website is if you look right here, it's going to say Sample reported job titles. So that means when you're looking for a job, you're not just looking under marine biologists or environmental restorational planners. You could also be looking for all of these other titles right over here. So that's one of the reasons why people have a hard time finding jobs is they don't always know what they're looking for. And this website details it out. And also, if you scroll down, you can see it talks about the type of task, the tools and technology, the type of knowledge that you need, the skill sets, the abilities, um, work activities, which is really nice because it breaks it down, um, like getting information, observing, receiving, and otherwise obtaining information from all of relevant sources. Um, so it really gives you an idea of what is done on this job. Um, you know, breaks it down to work context, like how much of the time are you spend on electronic mail, the telephone, freedom to make decisions, connect with others, structured versus unstructured work, that sort of thing. So I think that's really nice. Um, when you scroll down here, you'll see that this is what I was talking about when it talks about education, um, how much of it is a bachelor's degree versus a master's degree. So this is to give you some idea that you don't have to have a master's degree, but it looks like your odds of getting a job are probably going to be significantly better if you decide to do pursue forward with your education. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is if we just keep scrolling down here, um, this is where it talks about wages and employment trends, and this is where I'm pulling the information from. A lot of this information is national, but if you want, you can break it down by state by picking the drop-down menu, and that's going to change things quite a bit, um, which is really awesome. One of the things I will say is that I caution you when you're looking at this type of information, don't make it the sole basis of all your choices. I found this website because I used to, for a very, very brief period in time, I used to be a, a college career counselor. So when you wanted to enroll in the college, you come in and talk to me and I'd talk to, to you about your interest in enrolling you in a program. And one of the questions people asked was, how much money can I make in this field? And for liability reasons, you know, they, the school didn't want any of the counselors saying anything because you know, we didn't want a student to turn around, graduate, maybe have a hard time finding a job, and then turn around and said, well, you said I would make this much money, or graduate and find a job that didn't make as much money as set. So it was always easier from a liability standpoint to say, well, go talk to the government, go look at the government's website, it's based on statistics, here you go. The good news about it is it's easy to access information, and it does break it down by state. There is usually a huge difference in pay when you're looking at um, working near the coastal cities because there's a higher cost of living than, say, if you work in the Midwest. Um, one of the things I will say is that this doesn't take into account local trends, which you're not always going to get that information just from a website. That's where you have to go in and dive in deeper. So one of the examples I would say is um, when I was at this college, we had a program for people who wanted to um, become mechanics of airplanes. And if you looked at the statistics nationally or via the state, it was significantly different than if you looked at it locally. Locally, um, I live in the Central Valley. We have a lot of agriculture. And because fruit has a short shelf life, you have to ship it out or move it out pretty quickly, especially if you have places uh, like Japan that are willing to pay a lot of money for fresh fruit. Um, you know, your choice is to getting it to Japan or either via a boat or an airplane. And so it makes sense for our area to have a high need for um, mechanics to fix airplanes because you have a lot of fruit that can go bad really, really quickly. And if you have someone that's willing to pay for it, you know, it makes sense to have a lot of jobs because you want to keep someone on hand to keep your machines well maintained. So first of all, they never get to the point of breaking, but also to the point that if they do break, you're not worried about having all this fruit go bad. So from that standpoint, even though we statistically knew 
we could get, a, you know, a lot of people, these jobs could get really high paying jobs immediately. Um, that was something our school was very hesitant to say because of legal liability. So that's why I say this is a great starting point. Um, certainly don't rely on this website for all your information, but I would say that this is a great place when you're not sure what you're into or how one job is different from another. Um, definitely it's a quick, easy read. You just, just glance over the page and you can get some information and it'll help you make a quick decision as to yes, I'm interested in knowing more about this or no. So, but I also do like it because it gives you realistic expectations as far as um, what what's being paid. I know sometimes it's always hard when people are like, oh, that's not a lot of money. And you're like, well, it's all relative. Like, how much is a lot of money? So, um, one of the other things that I will say, just going back to um, the promises as far as avoiding the most miscommon understanding about employment is we're going to talk about um, waves. So you can see that there's big waves and little waves, and the big waves usually have to do with government-funded research. And so what I've been told is I actually have an uncle who was thinking about becoming a marine biologist, and he said one of the reasons he was really hesitant is because of the major waves. Of you're basically, if you want to do a lot of the research, you might be in the field, and that research is funded via a grant. So when that project is over, what do you do? What's your next project where, you know, you never know how long is it going to be before you find the next project or how long is it going to take to get the funding or what if someone else gets the funding and it doesn't make sense for you to work on that project because maybe you're not in that same geographic location and someone else is. So it's this constant up and down motion of never knowing what's going to happen. And part of it is it's just not realistic to think of a, a job that has a lot of research ongoing for um, that unless you work for a major company and you're in a research and development uh, area. So with that comes down here, uh, he was talking about uh, private, which could include contracts with multiple government agencies. And so when I was doing research online, I actually find, found um, an organization in Southern California that does just that. Um, they basically have a staff on board and they serve a lot of different governmental agencies. So for example, if uh, they want to test clean water or the feasibility of something or do an environmental study, they have enough business coming in from multiple government agencies that it works out to be a win-win situation because now the government isn't employing someone full time and they're not call calling them only when they need to, but instead you have a private organization that's basically um, facilitating everything and managing the schedules as far as um, organizing you know, the scientists that need to be working on which projects and at which time and because they serve so many entities, um, both private and government, that that's why they're able to create these little waves. So it's a lot more stable. Yes, things are still gonna happen, but it brings about a lot more stability. Okay, so I hope you're finding this helpful. Um, one of the other things that I would like to share with you is also um, how to think about this. You wanna think about long-term trends. I know a lot of times, sometimes you grow up, people asking you, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you say, I like, you know, I like animals or, you know, I love to swim and I like biology because it was really neat looking at the microscopes and that's how I chose my major, um, things like that. And so a lot of times when you're a kid, the way you focus on looking at a job is what you want. And the market doesn't always pay you for what you want. Oftentimes it pays you for one thing, and that is to solve problems. So your job is to look at what is it that you love and how can you help solve problems. So one of the things I want to take you back to was one of the earlier slides that I had showed you where I was talking about this umbrella and some of the different um, areas a marine biologist can do. Because I think that these three areas that I'm going to talk about are actually really good areas to focus on and think about. So the first one is going to be um, aquatic culture also known as aqu aqu aquatic farming. And so I like to think of it in terms of salmon. Um, you can always have wild salmon or you can have uh, salmon at a, at a hatchery that was grown. Um, it oftentimes costs a lot less because of that. 
but just with global population growing and growing and needing food sources, um, this is definitely an area to think about. So according to um, the NOAA Fisheries National Organic and Atmospheric Administration, their website says aquaculture, also known as fish or shellfish farming, refers to breeding, rearing, and harvesting of plants and animals in all types of water environments, including ponds, rivers, and the ocean. Researchers and aquaculture producers are farming all kinds of freshwater and marine species of fish, shellfish, and plants. So definitely something to think about. Um, the other thing I would think about is marine biotechnology. And according to the Marine Science Institute website, this exciting field was used for the latest breakthroughs in modern molecule biology genetic engineering and cell science to solve basic problems in marine resource biology to improve the production of medical chemical food and energy resources from the ocean and to develop new products and industries based on more efficient use of the ocean's resources so when you think about it the ocean's really really large and there's a lot of species in there that we haven't don't know about yet but Pretty much, it sounds like there's this whole industry out there that's saying, how do we use these resources? Um, certainly, there's a lot of diseases out there. Could the cure for cancer or these other diseases, um, the key to that be inside the ocean? So again, this sounds like a lot of research um, and development. Certainly, there are companies out there that spend a lot of money on research and development. The statistics for that is constantly changing. It seems like it's always increasing. So that is an area to be thinking about. The other area is um, environmental biology and toxicology. The, marine, the website, The Marine Careers, a sea grant guide to the ocean opportunities website says, environmental biology and toxicology including water quality research and the study of contaminants or pollutants in the coastal or marine environment, laws, regulations, and cleanup measures designed to protect the environment will ensure that the marine and the environment biologists and consultants continue to play an important role in society. I definitely think this is a really good opportunity too. Um, I know that people talk about, especially here in California because of all the agriculture, um, we talk about like water rights and fighting for water, but I also think that there seems to be more uh, interest in the quality of the water, especially with what I've seen in the news going on about um, quality drinking, the drinking water, is it okay, is it safe, is it helping to create um, disease in other people because they're drinking something that is not healthy for them. A lot of times uh, pharmaceuticals, like if someone doesn't finish their prescription or they get better or they don't need the whole prescription, a lot of times people are dumping those pills in the toilet and flushing them. And so all that stuff is entering into our drinking system and our, a lot of the wastewater management um, plants are not designed to handle that. Also, I've seen articles talking about the facial scrubs. Um, they have those little like micro beads in them so that when you clean your face um, the micro beads help take off all that dead skin cells well if you have all these plastic micro beads from a large population that's using them what do you do when that ends up in our in our sewage system and again a lot of our wastewater management systems wasn't designed to handle all of that so there was actually a law passed recently so that manufacturers can no longer use those in their facial scrubs. So these are all problems that definitely need to be addressed, especially as, again, we continue to grow as a population. Um, you know, clean water is becoming a bigger and bigger issue that's becoming at the forefront, um, especially because I'm seeing a lot of laws being passed, especially like in counties where if you use too much water, they're gonna fine you. So I don't think this is gonna go away anytime soon. This is something that I would uh, keep an eye on. I think there's a lot of opportunities to help solve problems. Okay, so um, keeping with the theme of the show, uh, learn three ways to respond when someone tells you you will not make a lot of money. The first thing that you can do 
is you can ask them, what do you consider to be a lot of money? Um, oftentimes, people have different ideas about what a lot of money is. Some people might say, well, why don't you go into teaching because it's a safe, steady profession. And a lot of people I've heard say, well, teaching doesn't make that much money, so why would I want to go into it anyway? But so one person might think, yeah, that's great money, and another person might think that it's not. And oftentimes when you talk to people, they have other reasons. It's not just how much money. It's, you know, people perceive a job as security. Does it offer benefits? Does it, you know, willing to pay for health insurance or dental or vision? Or, you know, does it offer insurance in case you get sick and you can't work? Like, uh, if you get hurt on the job, does it offer worker compensation? Or, you know, let's say you die in an accident, does it offer some kind of life insurance for your family so they have money so they can figure out what to do while you're not there and they have money to pay for the funeral expenses and, you know, the bills to keep going while they figure out what they're going to do. So definitely ask. When you do that, you have a conversation. And so a lot of times people like to lecture like, oh, you know, uh, you're not going to make a lot of money or that's not going to work out or, you know, you're too smart for that or why do you do this or why don't you do that? And it's just like blah, 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 blah. It's like, come on, really? But when you start asking questions, you're basically putting it back on them. They're like, whoa, well, I don't know. Like, you know, sometimes they might just throw out a number as far as what what is a lot of money. But it's all relative because what does that money buy you? Is that money going to be able to afford you to have your own home? Is it going to afford you to be able to pay for a car? Is it going to be able to say allow you to save enough away to pay for, you know, put money in a retirement plan? So this idea of what is a lot of money also depends upon what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? Um, what are the things that you want in your life? And certainly um, a job is one source of income, but it doesn't have to be your only source of income. So the more questions that you ask, it deflects them from constantly, I call it verbally throwing up all over you and just tell, you know, forcing their belief systems on you. But it gives you an opportunity to hear what they're saying and you might realize that they might be projecting their own fears onto you and it might not necessarily have to do anything with you. Uh, the other thing I would do, or the second thing I would do, is I would explain your career selection. And what that means is um, a lot of times when you're a kid, they tell you, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like, well, why do you want to be this? Why do you want to do this? And I think it's really interesting because so many adults are not happy with their job. They dread going to work. They dread getting up every day. And there was a really good quote that I like. Um, I believe it was by Steve Jobs who talks about never having to work another day in your life. And it makes sense when you, you do what you love. You're not working. You're getting up and you're going to play. And, you know, you might be getting paid to do a hobby or something you would want to do anyway. So when you explain that, you know, for the next 40 plus years of my working life, I don't want to do something I hate every day. I want to do something that I enjoy. I want to contribute to society. You know, I want to help change the world or I want to be part of a mission that I believe in. Um, it's much easier to go to work. And then not only that, you're more likely to invest in the skills that you need or to upskill. Uh, so basically that you can make more money because if you think about organizations, oftentimes there's like a ladder or a tier system and the more value you provide, the more you're compensated for that value. So it's actually easier to move up when it's something that you're really passionate about because it's something you naturally want to keep up with. You're going to want to keep up with the changes in that industry. You want to know what other people are doing. You're more likely to want to go to events or conferences that have to do with that industry. You're networking. There's so many things that can happen when it's something you want to do. And you don't look at it just from the only standpoint of making money. There's a lot of ways to make money. A job, a J-O-B is just one of them. The other thing I would say is the third thing is to educate. And what I mean by educate is that, you know, things have changed. Um, I know, especially like for my grandparents, um, you know, that was a generation where you could go and you could get a job and you could have the same job for 40 years, retire, and the company would sit there and they would pay you a pension. And so a lot of times what happens is a belief system gets passed down from generation to generation and the market's changed. The world has changed. 
Um, you know, a lot of companies right now don't offer pension plans. Um, a lot of employees move around from job to job every couple of years, cause, you know, for a variety of reasons. So the idea to stay at one job for 40 years doesn't make sense in this marketplace. And a lot of it has to do with just, um, you know, the way the market has evolved. And the Industrial Revolution, when you had a lot of large factories, it made sense for you to go to the factory every day and to get a job and to work and certain benefits were given to you. It was very stable and very predictable. But because of the advancing technology and what's happening, the marketplace is changing radically different. And, you know, employee employers need different things at different times. And so your job is to make sure that you have the tools and the skills to be able to keep up with the changing demands that are in the market. So when you educate, what you're really doing is you're not just educating, um, you know, family or people that care about you, you're also educating yourself. And part of it is when you talk to family, it kind of reinforces, you know, mom, you know, dad, you know, uncle, you know, aunt, you know, you know, your, maybe it's your friend's parents. It's things aren't the way they used to be, you know, in your generation. It was common for someone to have one one or two jobs throughout their whole life. And it was looked down upon to have go from job to job to job. But in today's marketplace, you know, it's kind of like the opposite. Things have flipped. Um, it's common for people to have a lot of jobs. Not only that, it's common for people to change industries quite often throughout their career. They might even have three different careers. And so it goes again to, you know, if I really enjoy something, I want to stay within that same field of area, you know, marine biology for the next 40 years. Yes, there might be a lot of different careers within marine biology, but, you know, you're going to be able to understand the field as a whole because you're doing different pieces. You're moving around within that pond, if you will, that body of water to try different things, but, you know, you're still vested in the same area versus jumping around from something completely different like I did, which was um, retail to insurance to, I guess you would say talk show host, <laughs> um, the career conversationalist. So, but I mean, also too, another idea is you don't have to have all your income from one source, which is the J-O-B. And, you know, there's opportunities to invest, there's opportunities um, to get educated in other areas whether it's going to be stocks, bonds, um, real estate, starting your own company, um, you know, selling things for other people and getting paid a commission. Um, there's also no reason why you have to, you have to do one thing and you can combine them. And so an example that I would give is if you like marine biology, then maybe you can do something like uh, write a movie script. And the thing that comes to mind is the movie Free Willy. Um, this movie came out in 1993. It was a family drama movie, and according to Wikipedia, it made over 153 million worldwide. So, I mean, who's to say that you can't be a marine biologist doing what you love, and maybe you know something about stirs in your heart about you know whales and you know being in tanks that maybe aren't big enough for them, or you know, maybe that they might miss their family, which is what this movie is all about. It's all about releasing the whale who's captured. Um, so, you know, I mean, you can take things and be inspired from your work and you can create something from it. You know, if you love writing, then maybe that's why you might create a movie script like Free Willy. It doesn't have to be this. It could be something else. You don't have to produce the movie. You can sell your script to someone else for them to go make the movie or for them to go use your brilliance. But what I am saying is that if you do want to create awareness in your career, you can take that knowledge and you can use it to create something else. You know, it might be a book that you sell. It might be a webinar. It might be, you know, some artwork or something that's inspired from it. There's lots of things that you can do to generate income. Income comes from the idea of providing value and being compensated for it. And so it's easier to have a conversation about what kind of value can you create and how you can move forward rather than focusing on a job. Because you can't always, you know, you can't always control the job market. The job market's going to do what it's going to do. Um, you know, if, if the economy is going great, there's going to be a lot of jobs. If the economy isn't, there's going to be less jobs. And so regardless, being a person of value is going to help you 
in either economy, regardless of how good or how bad it is, because now you're saying these are my skill sets. This is what I what value I can offer, regardless of whether it's in the form of a job, an independent contractor, whether it's you maybe consulting or doing something on the side. Like the conversation is really about money. If you want to be safe and secure, what can you do? What's within your control? And often the only thing that you really can control is your ability to skill up. So with that being said, um, I definitely encourage you to follow the money, um, follow the news, especially if you're looking for new opportunities. Um, I know one of the, just kind of going back to um, what's going on, a lot of times I just kind of watch the news sources to see, okay, who's talking, who's doing what, where's the money going? Because to me, I'm looking for new industries. That's how jobs are created is when something becomes a new industry. And just look at gaming, for example. You know, games weren't always common. It took time for that to develop into a new industry. You know, designing games is a fairly new job when you look at, say, comparing it to being a doctor. Being a doctor has been around a lot longer than being, you know, a creator of games. So in order to figure out where these new industries are going, that's why I say follow the money. So according to KQED Science website, engineers must resolve the question of how the Huntington Beach plant would draw in water. State regulators prefer an intake below the seafloor to make sure that it doesn't suck in fish and their tiny eggs, but a feasibility study this summer said building that this type of intake would cost too much. And so basically what happened is we're talking about desalinization and taking salt water, um, taking the salt out of the salt water so to make the water drinkable or so, so that it can be used for other things. So when I see that a billion dollars <laughs> is going to a project like this, this is something that I would definitely want to follow up on. And it goes back to what I was saying about other industries. Like maybe a government agency can, you know, hire a marine biologist all the time, but maybe they can hire, you know, a private contractor to come in and say, hey, we have this new technology done. You know, is this feasible? Is this going to work? And then, you know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about all the different projects. If you work for one company that um, handles these projects, then you can have more stable employment. And as the technology improves, then they're going to want to conduct more studies to see, you know, A, is this drinking water going to be safe? B, how is it being pulled up? We want to make sure that we're not creating more problems. We're trying to solve a problem, not just uh, fix one problem to create another. So things like that I would stay interested in. Um, just follow up. You never know um, your career in 10, 15 years. That might be something you would be doing. And part of that is just growing. You're going to grow. You're going to change. You're going to want new challenges. And you're going to find things different and exciting. And it could be that while you're young and single, you might be willing to do more research and travel. Um, you might want to be doing more of the grant programs just because you want that hands-on animal experience to be diving in the water and doing things. But as you grow older and you may want to settle down and have a family, you might be more happy to do um, research in a lab or visiting facilities and your lifestyle might change. So as your career changes, you can adapt it to your lifestyle depending upon what you are and what you want. So it's something to look forward to. It's something to be excited about. And that's why I say you don't just have to focus on one thing or what you like best. It could be what's going to be a great way for me to get started. And it just might be with the area of job growth. I mean, none of those jobs might truly excite you, but if your biggest concern is getting a job, then it's probably going to be easier to get a job there where the job growth is. See if that's something you really do or don't like, and then pivot to the next point. And it's going to give you really, really good experience anyway. So it just kind of depends. Is your, your biggest concern getting a job immediately out of college? And if it is, then it's really helpful to have some research so that when you're talking to your parents and they're saying, oh, well, you know, I don't want you to become this because you're not going to make a lot of money, it helps. Or more commonly when someone says, you know, especially with student debt, everybody's so concerned with student debt. And people say, I mean, well, I'm so worried about you taking on all the student debt. And you can say, you know what, look, but look at all these job opportunities. Like, I'm not just out there hoping for a job. I've done some research. Like, I know what's out there. I know, you know, who's hiring. Um, you know, that's something that gives you a lead because now you can take this information and find jobs. 
and you know realistically what they're parent paying so it's not some airy fairy discussion that's just out there so i mean it gives yourself calm helps you stay calm and your family members and other people around you are also concerned about your career choice um, whether you're going to be able to make any money and whether or not you're going to be happy with it so <laughs> i really appreciate you watching and staying as long as you have um, if you like what was said, then I would certainly encourage you to subscribe to my email list and you can go to the website grab your get, grab your free gift.com forward slash crystal o and what it is is I send out an email every week. It has the blog and it has an inspirational quote. And then what I'll be doing is I'll be sharing all the resources that I talked about with you. Um, on the blog so that you can click on the links. Um, I also really highly encourage you to subscribe to the email for other reasons. And that being um, not all these topics may interest you. So when you do find something that interests you, you're going to want to create a file in your email system. Um, you can put an exclamation mark career conversation list. And therefore, when something excites you and maybe you don't have a lot of time, you can save that, that file away so that when you're, you know, doing something, say you're out and you have a five-minute wait and you just kind of want to scroll through and look at some things, you know where to go to find that information. You're not wondering, where's that website? Like, there was a whole bunch of great websites she mentioned. Where am I going to find it? So I do encourage you to sign up for that so you can... Um, file that away for when you have more time if you don't have time right now or if you do have time you can always go back to it later um, just because there's some really awesome resources um, the other thing i would like to do is just kind of take a moment to thank um, technology this was made available because of google and their hangouts and youtube so this video will be available for replays and then also, I just want to let you know about what's coming up for next week. I've got an exciting show for you planned. So it's going to be about how to handle the anxiety of college debt, discover th three ways to reduce your need for student loans, avoid the most common mistake of all debt is bad debt, and learn three ways to manage fear so it does not manage you. And with that being said, I'm really thankful that you were here today and watched this um, production. It's my first one. So please let me know uh, what you think. And I'm happy to get some more feedback and continue to answer your questions and provide you with some great information. So thank you so much. And I will look forward to our paths crossing again soon. Take care.